So you must start with the self. Everything begins internally. It just does. Everywhere, and, and this is why so many people avoid it is because looking at yourself in the mirror and being real and objective with where you're at in life is a very painful thing for so many people. It's so painful that people kill themselves before they actually take the moment to look and be objective and honest with themselves and where their life has now brought them to because they've essentially just been a leaf floating in the wind of society, hoping to land where they want to go, but they're nowhere close to it. Welcome to the Lovecast with Jamal podcast. I am your host, Jamal Jabanji. I'm a best selling author, podcaster, full time life coach, and a communications and cultural analyst. After spending over 20 years of working with people in various stages of struggle and challenge, and after traveling to many places all around the world, visiting many different cultures, I have discovered the common roots of human suffering, along with the sustainable solutions required to help people heal and become whole and liberated. This podcast is my gift to you to serve you on your journey into healing, wholeness, and liberation. I invite you to buckle in and to settle in to each episode here on this podcast. There's something for you in each conversation. Guys, I have a treat for you today. We're sitting, I'm sitting across the proverbial podcasting table with a fantastic human being by the name of Joe Malone. Uh, I came across uh, Joe's story and uh, was really, really intrigued by his journey, by his life. Um, and I'm excited that uh, to bring him on the podcast today so you can hear a little bit more about his journey. Specifically, I'm curious, I'm a huge fan of a piece. And, you know, Joe has a perspective on peace that, um, that I'm intrigued by. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to kind of, uh, get into his story a little bit and, and, uh, you know, and, and really make some connections around, around what is peace and how do we achieve it, uh, specifically, specifically because of his background in the military. But, uh, Joe, before we get into your story, Joe, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for being here. Yeah, thanks, Jamal. I'm glad to be here, bro. And just so we're all clear, man, I am a huge fan of peace as well. I think everybody should certainly be. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's, uh, I feel like peace has gotten a bad rap over the years. It has a lot of baggage. You know, words can sometimes carry baggage. And, um, and peace is one of those things. A lot of people have a lot of different ideas about peace or they think peace is weak or they think it's passive in some ways. And, you know, my understanding of that is it's neither of those things, but, but I'm intrigued by your story particularly, but before we kind of get into that a little bit, uh, just for the listeners to get to know you a little bit, uh, can you tell us a, just a little bit about where you're from and what it was like for you? I always like to ask, what was it like for you as a kid growing up in your family? What did you experience? What, yeah. How would you summarize that? So I, I grew up on the southwest side of Chicago, like right, right at the cusp of, of the city. Okay. And it's a really interesting, man, I, I love history. I find it so interesting. Mm -hmm. And where I grew up was a mafia. I think it still is a mafia town, like classic Chicago, real outfit. And it was, the, the town was formed in the late 1800s and it was, known to be a Al Capone place, a big Al Capone, like it's one of the most haunted areas in the country. A bunch of dead bodies got buried all over the place. There used to be tunnels that went underneath the main road during the prohibition times that would go into these old dance halls and stuff. And I didn't know until recently, a couple of years ago, that it's still very active. Every police chief we ever had was all appointed by the mafia up until the early nineties when our police chief at the time, Mike Corbett was arrested for accessory to murder. Crazy book came out and it really just exposed all the shadow governance that takes place there. Yeah. So really cool bit of history sliver of, of town right on the, the cusp of Chicago, but it was also a, a choke point for a lot of narcotics trafficking. And unfortunately mm. I got involved with a really bad group of people when I was really young and my parents were very, you know, my, my mom left her farm. She was raised on a farm. She left at 19, met my dad. My dad was raised in the city. My grandfather was a Chicago firefighter. Uncle's a cop. Dad works for the FDIC. So very, he's a very like conservative mindset guy. My mother's very free spirited. 
and they provided very well, very well. My mom got laid off after 9-11. She used to work for the airlines, so she did a lot of odd jobs after that. But I, I had a very strong middle-class upbringing. I just got involved with really disgusting people at a really early age. I ended up, you know, I've done probably every single drug there is out there. You know, maybe not some of the new stuff if there's synthetic shit on the streets, but I mean, I shot up heroin for the first time when I was 16 years old and hmm. I continued to do it for some time after that. I, I stopped when I was 18, so about a year and a half, two years of shooting up dope, snorting dope, smoke crack, smoke, snorting cocaine, dr drinking booze and smoking weed was like an everyday thing. That wasn't even anything, but I just spiraled out of control at a very early age, unfortunately. And then my, uh, my best friend joined the Marine Corps. 2005. I saw his transformation. He wasn't as bad as me, but we were thick as thieves and he wasn't necessarily a role model kid himself. When I saw him march across that parade deck out in San Diego, I turned to his little brother, handed him two fresh packs of smokes. I was like, you can keep these. And he was like, wow, cool. Thanks. I still remember I was packed camels. And he was like, why are you giving these to me? And I was like, so I'm going to join the Marines. Hmm. And one year to the day, I found myself marching across that same parade deck. So turned my life well, around pretty, pretty drastically. Yeah. Thank Thank you. Yeah, totally. Thank you for sharing what I'm curious. Um, as you saw your friend walking across that graduation stage, getting out of boot camp, what, what did you notice in him that was so attractive to you that really prompted you to, and on the spot, just give your life into that direction? Well, we'd, we'd known each other since we were like 12 years old and spent every day together. I even lived with his family for quite some time in high school because my parents just had enough of my shit and threw me out. But when I saw him, it was like he was just a different person. His skin glowed differently. His energy, his vibration. I didn't know this at, at the time, but looking mm -hmm. back at it now retrospectively because nobody's ever asked me that question. It was his frequency was just different okay. and it wasn't necessarily high vibration positive but it was so magnetic and it was the amplitude was so extreme and it was so drastically different that i i think i began to see what was possible in this life mm -hmm. okay. where if he can go from the skinny punk 120 pound kid who wears an element skateboard t-shirt and hat everywhere warp tour concerts and smoking weed to a Marine, man, maybe I could too. Maybe there's other things that I could accomplish in this life that I never thought were even imaginable. And it proved to be true. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. You know, I can, I, I can relate with your story a, little, uh, a lot in the sense of just being a teenager, you know, I, I remember, you know, starting smoking 11, 12 years old, started drinking heavily yep. and kind of getting into that. And, and um, I'm just curious, um, as you just, you know, you're at this place in life, as you look back on that season of life, your teenage years specifically, do you have a sense as to what was driving you? Uh, was it for me? I had a lot of anger, unprocessed anger. I look back and go, yeah, I was trying to figure some things out. I was a lot of, you know, there, my relationship with my, with my dad wasn't the best. There was a lot of pent up, just, re, you know, just resistance to some, some, just the way I had been perceived and treated in my, in my life. That was my, that was what was driving a lot of my quest to try to fill this kind of a void that I was feeling. I wasn't aware of that at the time, but I'm curious for yourself. Um, do you know what was driving you as far as to get in? Like what, what prompted you? Cause I know you said that, you know, you guys had, you know, your family had, had, had means that they were, it was a good upbringing. So for you, what was it that was driving you? Do you think? I think there is some similarity there. My, my dad was never home and <laughs> I understand now that we are only capable of loving other people the way that we love ourselves. And the, the vast majority of the time, unfortunately, nobody ever learns how to actually love themselves outside of the way that they were taught or that they were raised or that they were impressed upon in their conditioning and their, in their youth. And <laughs> I, I get that now. My dad was a product of that. 
My grandfather sure. was a hard dude, Korean War yeah. vet, Heartbreak Ridge with the 2nd Army Infantry Division. They got slaughtered. After a year in Korea, he got wounded. I have no idea how he survived after seeing his wound and knowing what I know now. It was a bad, It was he thought he was going to die. Became a firefighter in Chicago for 30 some years. Old school, no gas mask. We're talking the 60s. So my dad was raised in an environment where love wasn't necessarily expressed mm-hmm. other than through strict reprimand and physical abuse, you know, hitting or whatever. Some people call it abuse. Some people don't. And I think that confused me a lot as a kid because I never had that explained to me. It was he was never around because he worked so much, which good on him like love is an action right so he, he i know that he loved me but he just never sure. was capable of expressing it so i think that and chasing chicks like all the hot party girls wanted to hang out with the older what i now realize was pedophile pervert dudes crack addict disgusting pieces of people who just need to be realigned um sure and i think the combination between that it kind of like gave me an outlet gave me some sort of certainty by clouding up my mind and trying to find some sort of release. And, uh, yeah, I think that that's it. Yeah. Thank you. That, 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 that totally makes sense. Totally makes sense. Yeah. There's a lot going on. I, I feel like, especially with young people, you know, when you're, when you're, uh, growing up, when you're teenagers, you know, that we're feeling, there's so much that we're, we're trying to figure out the world. We're trying to figure out who we are. And, um, when, you know, it's really important. I always tell people this, it's really important to be seen. And obviously, and like you said, and I love what you said there, you can't, you know, a parent can't give what they haven't received in many ways. So, you know, everybody's doing the best they can with what they have, but you know, if they're not, they don't, if they're not able to see themselves, you know, in order to love yourself, appreciate yourself, you actually first have to see who you are. And if they haven't done that work, then it's really hard for them to pass that on to their kids. You know, and I, I yeah. think, I think kids, then feel the absence of that sense of being seen and being appreciated. And then of course that creates a trauma, um, at the, at an emotional level. And then we're trying to fig- figure that one out. I know I was, you know, for, for many years. Um, but I appreciate you sharing that. So obviously the Marine Corps, you saw something, there was some, you know, almost like your, your friend had discovered a part of himself that you had never seen before. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was attractive. So you get into the Marine Corps, then, then what happens? Uh, mm-hmm. what, how did that take off for you? So I did my first four years. I deployed a bunch of times. I think I did four deployments in the first four years. And I, it, my job wasn't anything too crazy. I was just like a, ve- I was a vehicle driver. Mm-hmm. wanted to join the infantry. It was 2005, 2006. So they were getting mm-hmm. slaughtered. There was a lot of open spots for it. But I made such a stupid choice at the time because my girlfriend, who I knew wasn't going to last, and she was like, don't. So I was like, all right, what's the next coolest, dangerous job to get me out? You know, and I didn't want to join the Marine Corps and not fight. I thought that would be like a big waste of my time and energy. So they told me a truck driver because IEDs were becoming a new thing and truck drivers getting blown up left and right. So for some dumb reason, I did that job and it was cool. I got a lot of unique experiences out of it. I was in Iraq. Not my first four years. My first four years, I did Afghanistan and then I did various other, they're like humanitarian operations. So there was like a cyclone in Burma. There was like an earthquake in Indonesia and you're basically going around trying to help stabilize the region um, for for those countries. So Afghanistan, yes, uh, it wasn't. And then I got out and the way I got out was crazy. I was in Afghanistan and then they flew me home. And then two weeks later I was out. And so now I'm just like out of the Marine Corps. Oh, wow. Didn't know what to do. Uh, so I ended up living out of my car for six months, driving across the country, went to like 46 different states and just tried to recenter myself and decided I want to go to paramedic school. So I moved back out to California because that's where my last duty station was. And I had a beautiful beach bungalow right on the beach in Oceanside, literally my porch, the Strand Road, the beach. I love that area. Yeah. Oh my God, dude. It's uh, it's a lot different now than it was. They didn't have any of the big hotels back then. They had the old Top Gun house still, but you could just live there and nobody would bother you. And I, I really liked that a lot. And I loved California. I wanted to be a paramedic in California. And I just had a lot of good things, a lot of good momentum going for me when I was going through paramedic school because I had some experience. 
And something just, you know, I was having an affair with this chick for years. She was married, was sleeping with me like every day, always telling me she was going to leave home. And I just got wrapped up in this crazy negative spin. And that's really where a lot of my, my problems began in hindsight, which is hilarious. Uh, a lot of uh, book of uh, Kings in the Bible when I was reading Bathsheba and all, there's just a lot of similarity and all that and how things fall apart whenever you don't live in alignment. But I always wanted to do more and the Marine Corps never had a special operations component. They opened up their special operations component to inactive reservists. And what's crazy is I have had the, the inclination to do it. So I looked up what's called the MAR admin, which is like the administrative reports they put out. And that day they had just released inactive reservists. So guys who were in, but got out could be eligible to go to assessment and selection. That's the initial mm -hmm. trial period for the year long training program, nine month training program at the time for MARSOC, the Marine Special Operations component. And so I said, okay, cool. Well, how do I do that? And I just did it. And then I went back in the Marine Corps, I got selected and then went through the nine month training program. And then I did the, the next seven, eight years in Marine Special Operations, deployed a few more times, Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, and it was crazy. It was, it was nuts. Wow. Uh, and, ha and how, and how did the special operations, you know, division of the Marine Corps and your experience there, how was that different than your, than your normal Marine Corps experience? Oh man. In every way possible. Like that doesn't even, the funding is probably at that time, I think it was like a hundred times greater for a fraction, like a minuscule fraction of the force. Mm -hmm. Marine special operations is, I think it's the smallest group. And I don't know if I could really say how many people are in it, but I'll just say like less than a thousand. And yet the budget was bigger for us as a thousand than it was for like 50,000 Marines or something like that. Mm -hmm. So you had the funding, you had the freedom to get a lot of training in a lot of advanced skills, work with different agencies, work with different branches of the government, different special operations units. And it was fast paced, man. I mean, it was intense. You were either in it or you weren't. A lot of guys got divorced. A lot of guys uh, relationship sure. fell apart and a lot of guys fall apart. And that's kind of what happened to me towards the end. Got burnt out. Okay. What do you, you know, because you're, you're, you're privy to so many things, you know, being in special, special forces or special operations. I mean, that's like you said, it's an elite group of people, um, go all over the world. What, what do you feel like maybe in an overall kind of sense, what did you learn about the world, about the way things are that maybe you didn't know before you got into special operations? What, what, what did it show you? That's a great question. It did give me a lot of perspective and insight. I was always a world traveler. My, when my mom worked for the airlines, free spirit, she would always take us places and I would always go off on my own. So I was already pretty cultured for a young guy. But when I really started living in these nations and, and fighting and working alongside these people, and then also seeing the second and third order effects, meaning like the regional and then the global strategic interest of the United States being enforced or impacted, it showed me that the news is... Don't even bother listening to it. Yeah. Sure, listen to it, but realize that you're so far behind of what's actually taking place on the ground. It also taught me that our our politicians are so insanely out of tune with everything that it, it really makes me want to have limitations on terms. And I don't think you need to be in the service necessarily to be president, but I... I'm, I lean very much towards having to have some sort of service to be in Congress or the Senate or something like that, because these people are making choices and it's people are dying and mm. we're, we're always supporting the wrong people. We're supporting the worst people. Yeah. And that was a big reason why I ended up getting out. So yeah, it's, things are, are not what, what you think people mo are mostly good. And um, yeah, I mean, it's, I want to kind of hone in on that state. That's a fascinating thing that you just said there. People are mostly good. You know, I, I came to that conclusion after working in a prison after five years, people say, what's my number one takeaway. 
<laughs> after working in a, in a, in a state penitentiary for five years, I walked away. So I, I came into that job thinking, you know, some people are just bad and you know, they're just, you know, evil or whatever. And after five years, literally I, it completely shook me at, at, to the core because I couldn't find a person. And I, I was around folks that, you know, they, you know, you can imagine and heinous, heinous mm-hmm. things that they had done. I could not find a person once I got to understand their story and go just beyond the story a little bit, whether it's their story, their family story, some perspective of the mind. I can't, I could not shake the awareness that I came away with, which is that people are fundamentally at the core of them. Good. And and we all desire the same things. And um, it changed my whole outlook on people, even though, you know, I, I'm obviously very aware of what people can do and what people are capable of uh, when they live out of their stories. But I'm talking when you get beyond that. I, ha- I had an opportunity to visit Iraq uh, during the height of the insurgency during two, 2006, 2007. I had a friend uh, that had was doing some some humanitarian work with an NGO in the, in the north of the country, in the Kurdish areas. I love that area. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And, uh, we, we visit, we were there, you know, I, I was there, uh, two or three times and, uh, it's you sit so, right there. did they think you were Kurdish? Yeah. I mean, except for the bald head. Sometimes they would look at me like, hey, what's this I mean, It was a little different, but yeah, I did. I mean, a lot of folks, they just assumed I was Arab or something, but, uh, or, you know, um, but the Kurdish were, were, you know, really kind people. And I, I actually them. forgot where, I, where I was half the time when I was there, I was like, is this, I You're mean, safer is, uh, there than in America. Yeah. It's it's oh, yeah. I, I I hate what we have done to the Kurdish people. It's it's that's we'll get into that I guess in a, in a minute why I got out. But um, anyway, sorry, keep going. Yeah, yeah, it was it was eye opening. But I became aware almost like yourself. Like I was like the, the media. What the media does to people is it so skews our understanding of how the world is. And I started realizing like, you know, folks are not you know. And I got to visit. The West Bank at one point, and uh, you know the folks that you know I was always taught that were, you know, terrorists or whatever. And and just by being in the in the in that region and just realizing like these are human beings, these are mothers yeah. and fathers, and they have children, and people are going to work and trying to figure out their life like everybody else. But you realize like the narratives that are being pr- promoted to pit people against each other. It, it's just very eye opening. You see those narratives. I saw it obviously internationally, but then you, you start to hear it in our, our domestic politics. And it's just, what's the end, you know, to what end, to what is the end game here of all of this? And it's really interesting. And I, 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 um, you know, became aware of a lady who had actually served about 10 years in, in the CIA. She was a counter uh, terrorism um, expert. And one of her, one of her jobs was to to be to embed herself uh, as a journalist and to to do research on folks who were part of you know uh, terrorist organizations or what was classified by the by the government as state or state state department would classify these organizations as terrorist organizations. And her job was to infiltrate them as a uh, as a journalist and to interview them to understand their psychology. And after about ten years of doing this work, she said nobody sees themselves as the bad guy. <laughs> Yeah. The way everybody's the good guy and everyone feels victimized at some level. And and she said, and their story is not actually different than the story we're telling ourselves. And she ended yeah. up getting out of the whole thing going, this is a bunch of BS. And we're perpetuating this. Yeah. It's like, I, I can't. And it was, and it's, it's very similar to what I've heard you say of just, you know, when you kind of see through the, 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 the rhetoric of us versus them and, um, can you say a little more about that? What what specifically opened your eyes to this, even to seeing the goodness of people at the core? I there's probably an accumulation of experiences. One, a couple that resonate to me is like is some human trafficking that I witnessed out in Southeast Asia. I realized I didn't understand what human trafficking really was until that that point in time. After, and which is a crazy story, girl from Cambodia, I bought her from the bar in Thailand, not with the intention of having sex with her, but specifically with the intention of just buying her so she didn't have to prostitute herself out for the night. And so we got a bottle of Johnny Walker Red Label, went back to the hotel, and she spoke really bad English, but it was enough for her to tell me her story that night. She killed the whole bottle with me, and she was like 100 pounds soaking wet. 
And she'd been sold by her father, who's a farmer, to the Cambodian mafia. The interest rate that he owes, she'll never pay it off with all the people that she sleeps with. And that broke. And when I woke up the next morning, she didn't even rob me. She just took her stuff and left. And that really has resonated with me a lot and will till the day I die. Mm. I just human trafficking goes down. But that was, was one instant. You know, it's not just some chick trying to have fun. It's a human being who was sold and mm. she's a slave. And then... I think standing over a bunch of dead bodies throughout my career, it's just every time I get this feeling of why, like, what was the point of this and why are we doing it to each other? You know, what, what do we really, now I will say that I have experienced real evil. Like I've without a doubt, a hundred percent, it made, it made my stomach sick when I came across these people. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't the way they looked. It wasn't the way that they dressed or the circumstances in which I was apprehending them. It was just their energy was, it was something weird. Do I believe it was the, the I, I believe in possession. You know, mm -hmm. I, I think that we allow ourselves to get wrapped up and the chemicals, neurochemicals start to develop. And I think you can go too far to a point where you're lost internally and you're just being run by this demon. And if that is what it was, then that's what it was. But if not, then most people really just want to live happy, peaceful lives and don't want to be bothered. And that's also when I started diving into like the United States. I'm like, why do we do this world policing BS? And I don't agree with it at all. I think it's a terrible idea and it's done for money. And I really want us to get more honest people in government so we can stop funding these types of wars. Mm, so good. So well said. Um, I want to ask you this question, um, and, and this is you know, I'll just might take us a different direction. But I'm curious as to how you would define mental resiliency. How would you define that? How, how do you understand mental resiliency? What is that? Yeah, that's a great question. Going back to when you you asked me what type of perspective have I gained, I mm -hmm. I, I would say probably the the greatest global perspective I've gained is the information operations that take place every day, the programming, the Orwellian 1984 conditioning of your mind. When we look at social media, especially with the upcoming generation and how influential it is, Harvard did a study where they would hand people the cold coffee, tie the shoe, take the, and then they'd read them a script. I don't know if you ever, have you ever heard that study before? No, I, I don't think so. Can tell us. About they would it. hand them a cold coffee and they did this exactly the same for everybody. One person would say, can you hold this for a second? They tie their shoe, thanks, and then they would leave. Then a surveyor would come up and read them, hey, 25 bucks for five minutes of your time, sure. They would read them an excerpt from a story and they would say, how would you describe the protagonist? Well, the people they gave the cold coffee to, the protagonist was cold hearted and selfish and shallow. Exact same study, warm cup of coffee, just holding it for literally a second to they tie their shoe. How would you describe the protagonist? warm, inviting, caring, 86% minus, plus or minus a little bit of a margin of error for both sides reported that. So the way that our environment conditions us and how malleable we are, we convinced some Taliban guys that some of their leaders were acting as double agents for the United States and we got them to hang their own people. That's wow. crazy. Like, 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 that's like me convincing you, your childhood friend has betrayed you and you kill him. That's how easily people are manipulated. It's kind of what you're saying here. And so mental resiliency is the ability to not be influenced by those external factors, those external conditions. And it only comes from developing yourself within and the way that you mm. talk to yourself and the way that you believe in yourself, because our thoughts become our emotions and our emotions become our actions and our actions dictate the quality of our life around us. And so you must be capable of identifying yeah. when people are trying to manipulate you and you identify that by realizing your emotions are being triggered in a certain way because information goes to the emotional part of the brain two times faster than the logical wow. part of the brain. And when you can start to condition yourself, because when you do things over and over again, habitually it becomes a habit or repetitively sure. becomes a habit in the subconscious. Now you're subconsciously recognizing recognizing I'm being emotionally driven somehow. I call it emotional hijacking. And why is this taking place? And when you could then pull yourself back, objectively observe what is taking place and then make your own decision on how you want to respond to it. That is when you begin to develop true mental resiliency. Unbelievable. I love so much of what you, what you said there. There's a lot there. There's a lot there. So what I'm hearing you say, you know, overall is that people are really easily manipulated. 
um, yeah. just through, through, through suggestion. And you've seen it firsthand, obviously being in the military, how easy it is to manipulate people to do, to get, to get them to do what you want them to do. Mm -hmm. um, how is this happening? Here's my question. How do you, and just from your perspective, I'm just curious, how do you see this happening to our society now? Or how, how have you seen it? So I think a lot of what we see going on these days is a direct result of external influence, specifically by the Chinese government. And what do I mean by that? Before we dive down into some Joe's a conspiracy person, right? Well, don't forget China has been around since the beginning of time, like one of the oldest groups of people ever, not China, the country, but you get what I'm saying, the region. Sure. Sure. And they always play the long game. There's a book called the hundred year plan uh, about China's long-term global strategy. And so what they do is they utilize all sources of information to influence people like you, me, everybody in the United States has a profile over in the Chinese government and their job is they have people assigned to regions. Like they have billions of people in the country. So they have plenty of people to do this stuff. Everybody, when you see Chinese tourists taking pictures and stuff, they really need to send that stuff back to the Chinese government. And then if anything pops within these algorithms that they have, they get the privilege to drive a car or they get extra grocery money or something like that, or the ability to buy a condo because it's a communist nation. You can't just live where you want to live and do what you want to do. So what the Chinese government is getting much better at doing is influencing our youth, especially through social media. Now you hear about stuff in TikTok. I don't know. Yeah, it is. But all the stuff we're seeing in the government, I think it's more control based as to why they want to ban that. But when you look at Chinese kids, nine year olds, they want to be chemical engineers and rocket scientists. When you look at our nine year old kids, they want to be influencers and drag queens or something. So a lot of it is being done purposefully to emasculate and to essentially neuter and confuse the people within the United States to propagate anxiety and fear so that drug use and alcohol use go up, which creates its own set of problems and circumstances and ultimately break apart the nuclear family concept within the United States, which causes plenty of other issues in itself. And so I think that is where the vast majority of programming information ops, psyops is coming from is from our foreign adversaries. Hmm. That's super, super interesting. Today's episode is sponsored by Free to Love Corporate Solutions. Did you know that any company or organization is only as competent, capable, and responsive as its workforce? And did you also know that, nationally speaking, it's been estimated that stress costs companies up to $150 billion, B with a billion, $150 billion in lost productivity every single year. What if your company and your place of work can actually be a source of healing and transformation for its workforce? Well, believe it or not, there is a growing community of conscious companies and businesses that see it as their mission to be a place of healing and transformation, not just for the products that they're offering to the, to the wider world, but also it, they really desire that their, their place of employment would be a culture of healing and transformation for the workforce itself. And I've had the opportunity to work with a number of small businesses that are just doing fantastic work in the world. And I've actually want, I want you, I would like you to hear from the founder and CEO of a company that is striving to make a difference, not only in the world, but also in the people that work for the company. Um, I own a real estate brokerage, BRA Realty, here in Pennsylvania, and we have about 110 realtors. Um, Jamal came out a few weeks back and uh, did a training in replace of one of our regular trainings, and the feedback was phenomenal. Really stuck with me was he created a space of safety for a conversation of transformation to take place, where um, not just did agents walk away with great tips and insight about what's driving them, but also the ability for them to actually take the time and work on themselves in that session 
uh, specifically around getting clear on what matters most to them. And to the point where we had multiple agents that were actually crying. We had, I had multiple agents come up to me afterwards just saying it was one of the best trainings we've ever done and that we should have Jamal back once a month. So just to give you a, you know, a quick uh, shout out, Jamal, you did an amazing job. Thank you so much for that. Thank you for your ongoing coaching with myself. I've been working with you now for over three months and have had really, really great results. Um, I intend to stick with it as there's always room for growth and having someone like you in my corner has been really helpful. So I appreciate everything you do and thanks for being you. So if you're a small business owner, maybe you're a, on the executive team, you're a founder, a CEO, or even if you're just in management at some level at a company or in a, in a corporate culture where you oversee people at any capacity. And if you're interested in having a conversation where we may be able to explore how our program can assist you, can assist your company and assist your workforce. I'd love to have a conversation with you about that possibility. All you have to do is go to my website, jamaljavanji.com forward slash corporate solutions. Again, that's jamaljavanji.com forward slash corporate solutions. You'll be able to fill out a form there and we, we will get back with you and uh, set up a time to have a conversation with you about how we can assist you in transforming your company. You know, and I've, I've you know, I, and I think I'm a student of history. I love, I love history. I think it's so important to know history, but I just, even, even in, um, from my understanding, my, our own country's history is just drawing the connection of when I think it was the late sixties, early seventies, when people were questioning some of the, the paradigms, the, the, the ideas of perpetual war and all of these things that there was a concerted effort. Um, and you know, that there, uh, there have been folks that have documented this. I mean, but even folks from the government who have come out yeah. and said, yeah, this was a concerted effort to get to introduce drugs, uh, ad very oh, addictive yeah. drugs to the population to get people to, um, to get people to become dumbed down, to get people, yeah. to, you know, to, to lose this sense of kind of going back to what you were saying, like, you know, in order to be, to be able to be manipulated, you, you have to, you have to be disconnected from yourself. You have to be disconnected from what's happening on the inside of you. You, you have to be, um, you know, inflamed in some way or, you know, out of, out of alignment in this, what I call it disease, right. Out of, out of alignment with yourself and, and, you know, mentally, spiritually, um, emotionally in every area. And this makes you moldable and malleable and, and subject to control. And this was a, you know, I feel like any, any government that, or a group of people that have an interest in controlling a mass population will, will, will utilize these tactics. And so what I'm hearing you say is that that's happening, you know, by foreign governments as well as our own governments. Yeah. There, um, there's a lot, I mean, by our foreign governments, our own governments, by marketing companies, by the military sure. industrial complex, like by everyday people, it's, it is just this barrage and that's sure. even more of the reason why it's absolutely imperative that you have that mental and emotional resiliency. Yeah. Yeah. And thank you. And, and so I want to ask you, um, and I was, was going to ask you this, what do you think the solution is? Like if somebody says, okay, this seems kind of crazy, you know, I, I know people throw around the, 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 the term the conspiracy theory it seems like a big conspiracy theory, but I think deep down people understand a lot of folks understand this. I mean, this is not, uh, you know, I started to you just, all you have to do is pay attention to the news, pay attention yeah. to, to patterns and trends. I started to notice myself every election cycle yep. when we have a major presidential election, you see a ramp up in things that actually uh, affect the nervous system of human beings, whether it be fear, whether it be anger or outrage. There are always things that, that kind of make the headlines that trigger people with these. And I was like, I, you start to see, if you pay attention enough, you'll see that this is a pattern. This is a very cyclical pattern that happens every so often here. Um, what do you think the solution is to all this? How can people like, what would you say if someone says, Joe, what do we do? What do we need to do to protect ourselves or to actually fortify ourselves so that we're not able to be manipulated and taken down a road that we don't want to go down? So you, you just use two really great words for that. Protect and fortify. The So let me also say this is that I don't 
talk about this type of stuff very often, like in a lot of my content, I'll, I'll mention it from time to time because I want people to just understand what's taking place from my perspective. And for sure. anybody who says that I'm a conspiracy person, it's like, I, I look at them and I'm like, I could care less what you think because you're obviously so inexperienced in the world. Sure. You've never even left your hometown or you've never gone these places. You've never participated. It doesn't even phase me because it's just some child usually, regardless of their age, ranting about why they think I'm crazy, which goes to prove my point that they're mentally and emotionally very weak. They have no resiliency because they're so inflamed over my comments. So I do love to focus on what can we do to combat against this insanity. And the first thing is you must look within yourself. And this is all coming from my own experiences. This sure. isn't something I've read out of a book. This is what I do every single day of my life still. I've been doing it for five years mm -hmm. strong and it's what got me to the place where I am now and continues to allow me to grow. So you must start with the self. Everything begins internally. It just does. Everywhere, and, and this is why so many people avoid it is because looking at yourself in the mirror and being real and objective with where you're at in life is a very painful thing for so many people. It's so mm -hmm. painful that people kill themselves before they actually mm -hmm. take the moment to look and be objective and honest with themselves and where their life has now brought them to because they've essentially just been a leaf floating in the wind of society, hoping to land where they want to go, but they're nowhere close to it. But the, the answer to that is it's okay because you're not as far as you think you really are. You could be as far off as humanly possible, but guess what? If you remain consistent with a solid structure plan, you can get there in a couple of years. Oh, a couple of years. We well, are going to be there anyways. You're right. going to grow old and you're going to die. You might as well grow old trying to go for that thing and making something of your life. I call that the true self, the realignment process to the true self, as opposed to just be miserable about it and further perpetuate your pain in a negative way. So what does that mean to start within the self? The best way to begin to make change is to begin to change your physical habits. And it starts by waking up early. For me, I had to get up super early because I needed to, I could not drink at all. I started drinking at like 6, 6.30 PM. So I would pop a sleeping pill, be up by like 2 AM. And I still get up around 3 AM every single day of my life, have for, ever since 2018. And I immediately noticed, hey, I have all this time. So then I started to journal. I started to put my thoughts out on paper, manifest from the abstract to the concrete. Do things that change your habits. What I tell my clients is if you, whatever time you wake up at, wake up five minutes earlier. Usually I'll tell people, wake up at five, wake up at 4.55. Then when you wake up, drink a tall glass of water and that's it for the first week. And they're like, mm -hmm. you're crazy. No, I'm not. We're building new habits. Brush your teeth with your left hand. Create new neural connections. Neurons that fire together, wire together. And if neurons are wiring together within the brain that are of an, an unusual pattern, that allows you to think differently. Something as simple as brushing your teeth in the morning with your left hand. Drinking mm. that tall glass of water. Getting up early. Because now the brain is being essentially like re-scrambled to say, hey... I'm not doing the same thing that I'm doing. So my thought processes are going to be slightly different, which opens up the opportunity to then begin to change the way that you think, to consciously recognize all the times that you're negative, all the times that you're thinking something bad about yourself or somebody else throughout your day. Just stop that and say, you know what? I bless that person. I bless myself. This is a part of the process. Things aren't as bad as I'm making it out to be. And now you're beginning to change the way that you think. So not only are you changing your habits physically, but you're changing the way you think, which is therefore going to change your emotions because we're emotional creatures two times faster than the logical part of the brain. But what's amazing about humans is that we have the ability to consciously intervene against those emotions to say mm. to ourselves, why am I feeling this way? Or screw it. I can't feel anything bad. I can't think anything bad today. I don't even listen to rap music anymore. No hard rock music. Like you need to get, get your environment ready to, to start to change because you, your environment, if it stays the same, everything else is going to stay the same and you can't expect sure. change out of the things you do the same time over and over again. So you must change the way that you think, which is going to change the way that you feel, which is going to change the way that you behave. Mm -hmm. And then we really start making progress when you start exercising. When you watch your diet, you're not eating processed chemicals that are designed to create oxidative stress on the inside of your body, which is the equivalent of external stress on the outside of your body. It's not shutting down your emotional regulatory uh, glands. It's not shutting down certain receptors within your body. You're working your body out so that you can now begin to 
push yourself into doing things that are uncomfortable, this is where the resiliency begins. And it's not just doing the workout, it's talking to yourself in a certain way during the workout. The way we talk to ourselves is so important. Mm -hmm. It's like everything. If you mm -hmm. talk to yourself in a negative way all day long and beat yourself down, then you're just going to live that type of a life, be that type of an energy. It's mm. all about elevating our energy. Everything is energy, our frequency, emotion, energy in motion. So we must be operating in the higher realm of vibrational plane as opposed to the lower, but most people operate in lower. Why? Because it's a primitive survival mechanism by default built into our brain. Bad experiences equal death. Brain doesn't want us to die. Stay away. Everything is bad. So when we develop the neurochemical disposition in the body, when we like working out and exercising, now we're elevating our frequency. We're feeling good. We're releasing endorphins. Now we're talking to ourselves positively. We're changing our physical habits in the environment around us. We're blessing people when we would normally be upset. This is when we start to see good momentum within the realignment process. It takes time like a rocket ship lifting off from, from the earth. The most thrust is required when it's first leaving the earth. But the further it gets away, the easier it is for it to coast and thrust throughout our space. And so same thing with you and making change. You must develop momentum, small, easy things that will build. And then before you know it, your life is completely turned around. Oh, so, so good. So good. And yeah, you know, I, and I love what you're, what you're saying there. I think, I think a lot of people underestimate the, the, the ability that we all have to actually change your, you know, your life. I, I people, you know, I'm oh, yeah. a life coach. And so people come to me and say, I want to change my life. And I say, you know, that's great, but it's not as complex as that. It's about changing your day. Yeah. If you can change your day, you can change your life because what's a life? It's a string of days. And I love what you said. Simple as waking up. You know, I like to tell people, make your bed first thing. Yeah. It's yep. easy to make your bed, drink water, drink a glass of water. I put a lemon in water, squeeze a, a lemon in there and drink a, a glass of water. People think that this doesn't do anything. I think, no, this is, ex this is exactly what you're saying. It's like, you're talking about up leveling your frequency through what you do physically food has a huge part of that, right? It's what I'm hearing you say is food plays a massive part of, 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 because what you put in your body is either going to up level your energy your frequency, or it's going to actually suppress it. Most people don't think of food this way. They just think of, you know, even people who try to think he like healthy, they they're usually thinking about body image when it's, it's so much more than body image. This is about, you know, what kind of energy, what kind of level of frequency do you have? Do you know what, which foods, does it, does it add to your frequency? Does it take away from it? And that's, a, that's a whole, obviously a whole subject we could talk about, but it's huge. But yeah. then some, something as simple as getting, getting control of your thoughts. I, I love to help people institute breath work and meditation in their, in their breath day. Work too. Is huge, yeah. It's a massive thing, but I appreciate you sharing that. But I guess a question I would have for you is, um, if somebody asked you how you distinguish from your perspective, how would you distinguish true self versus false self or actual self? Like what, how do you distinguish between these two, these two components? Um, and your, and your, what's your understanding of that? Yeah. So I, I do subscribe to the true self, actual self theory. Uh, and sounds like you what, actually are familiar with what, that. What can you talk a little bit about that for the listeners? What, what, how would you under, define the true self, actual self theory? Yeah. So I think it was, Descartes or, or Sartre, one of those philosophers, was talking about how the true self is the most maximum version of you in this life, the most healthiest version, the most loving version, the most giving kind, the most successful. Every single thing that you could possibly do with the greatest potential in this life is the true self. And we all start out there. But what happens is every promise that we break to ourselves, everything we know we should do but don't do, every cupcake that we eat, but we're like, oh, we shouldn't be eating all these cupcakes or cookies or whatever. Every time that we lie to somebody, we don't hold our word, it draws you further and further away from the true self. And the distance in between the actual self and the true self is where angst and you know depression, anger, things like that all come from. Angst is like the umbrella term. And so so the further we go, then the further we go down, I also equate this to the vibrational frequency chart where it's like, hey, you're going further down here. It's just pulling you down into negative energy. When we decide to make the change, and we begin to make these changes. That's what I call the realignment process. So mm. it's never just cool. Everything's 
all handy and going straight up. You need to like kind of bottom swing, like at the bottom of a wave when you're surfing. So you're still going to be going down a little bit because of the force of gravity and the motion that, and the inertia that you've had going into that negative frequency. But once you begin to maintain, and this is why changing our life is so difficult because people just want it to stop and then go straight up. But what happens is you're, you're doing it, you're doing it, you're doing it, but you're still falling down because of that inertia that you had. And so when you remain consistent, then you begin to pull yourself back up. And the consistency and the persistence is what's really important is because you're going to begin to then really realign yourself, pull yourself closer to that true version of yourself. And the closer you get, the better and more purposeful driven that you feel within this life. Love it. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I'm, I'm sure, you know, when you work with your clients, you, you really stress consistency. I know I try to do that in my clients as well. We, we set them up on a plan every, every day there's, they have to show up and kind of check in and do certain things because that consistency is pulling you, right? Awakening you, um, more and more to this, this true actualized self that we all possess. And, you know, it's amazing when you look at people, no matter how, how much of an idiot somebody may be, you may think that they're way beyond. It's like, no, they actually possess that. They possess this, yeah. this very powerful, um, essence of who they are. And the problem is they just haven't been able to, to even see that for themselves or access that. Yeah, um, cause they're most time we're not taught and we're just taught yeah. that life sucks and you're going to work and die and drink beer and watch sports. You know, like that's unfortunately the big thing that people get taught. Totally. Totally. Well, I wanted to ask you about this. Um, I know, so, so you, you were in the military, um, you know, you obviously get into the special forces, you, you eventually get out of it um, because you see what's happening and, and uh, you, you d develop a real appetite for, to want to help people and for peace and that kind of thing. But I know you were at a point and we kind of touched on this where you were, you know, you were considering ending your life, you know, being, being, being done with everything. Um, but then you discovered some universal laws. Mm -hmm. Wait, can you talk briefly about what, can you give us a summary of what are some of these universal laws you discovered that really saved your life? The biggest one is the law of vibration. Okay. That everything is energy and everything vibrates at that, at some frequency, whether that's high frequency or low frequency. Okay. And that correlates to everything within our life. So if I'm operating on a high frequency, I'm producing the neurochemical disposition, the hormones in my body that are associated with somebody who's elated, joyful, feels good, loving, true gratitude, servitude, things of that nature. And my brain now gets primed through the reticular activating system, which is a survival mechanism in the brain. Because everything is about survival and security in our brain, not our mind, but our brain just only cares about the avoidance of death and pain. And then reproduction comes like second to that. But it's really about the avoidance of death. Keep us alive, conserve energy. So when the reticular activating system is primed at that vibrational frequency, you're in tune with those things, those opportunities that operate at that level. And what I realized is I never really did that. In 2005, right before John went to boot camp, his mom put on the movie, The Secret. I thought it was stupid, whatever. Years and years and years go by. Well, just two years ago, I'm sitting in John Asaroff's basement, having a conversation with him about when he was in that movie and how him and Bob Proctor used to work together and all that stuff. So it just goes to show you that the law of attraction is real in some sense, but it's really the law of vibration and whatever emotion mm -hmm. you're emitting is directly correlated to the energy or the frequency of that energy that you're emitting, which goes out into the world, into the universe and allows you to either be a part of and see things at that frequency or whatever frequency you're operating at. You can't hear music on channel 101.5 if you're operating on channel 70.2. It's just not mm -hmm. going to happen. Sure, you can go up and down a little bit. You'll kind of sometimes get some static from the other channels, but you really need to get yourself elevated in terms of energy so that you could resonate at that level. And now your brain physically is being primed and programmed to see those opportunities in this life associated with mm -hmm. surviving, whether that's a job opportunity or a person you meet or something you hear in terms of creating money opportunity is really what it all boils down to. But that's the the biggest one that really stood out to me and, and changed my life. The law of frequency. Um, yeah. Yeah. And that's, I love that. That's so, so vitally important. And it's such good news, right? Because no matter what's going on in your life, you, you can boil it down to, okay, this is, this is showing me what frequency I'm tuned into. A lot of people think that's, um, that, that's, that shames folks. But I always say this, that, you know, um, it actually eliminates the possibility of you being a victim yeah. when you understand this law, because yep. 
everything is just showing you everything in the external world is simply showing you your frequency and you have control. There's a lot of things we don't control in life. The one thing we do have control over is what frequency we're operating on. And we yep. can, we can, we can learn how to change the station, so to speak, to up level the frequency. And I love that you're doing this work. Um, lastly, I know we're, I can, I could talk to you all day. I really, really appreciate your perspective and the work you're doing in the world. And one of the things I appreciate about your work is that you're really, you really have a heart. Uh, and I know that you're a, a veteran and uh, you come out of the, you know, the armed forces and uh, you know, there's so many people, um, so many veterans that are really struggling and suffering. And from my understanding, it's about 8,000 people a year, 8,000 veterans a year that end their life yeah. through suicide. And I mean, that's, I mean, that's a massive amount of people over, over the course of a decade. It's more, and it's like more than the wars. Like it's crazy. It's, yeah. It, 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 is, it is more than the wars we're fighting. There is more casualties, more. which is, I don't think people, I mean, I think, things can get lost in statistics and numbers, but these are people, yeah. these are people who are, you know, obviously who are serving our country and um, who are suffering tremendously. Can you tell us a little bit about your vision for veterans? Yeah. So, and, and just to really tie everything together, what we just talked about with the law of frequency and your ability to, put yourself on the frequency that you desire to be on that right there is the definition of mental and emotional resiliency <laughs> because you're so unaffected by the things in your external environment that you can keep yourself elevated up left, right, or at least you know what to do, push-ups, burpees, whatever it is to get yourself there. That right there is mental and emotional resiliency. And when it comes to the veteran community specifically, there's so much lack of purpose. What I've discovered being as I don't think it gets any closer to wanting to kill yourself than I did. I literally passed out wasted with my finger. It was a 30, 30 lever action rifle. And my thumb was still on the trigger when I passed out drunk, but he came over at like 3 AM was knocking on my door, knew something was wrong with me, woke me up. I woke up and my finger was actually still on the trigger. And I thought for a fraction of a moment of just pushing it, but I was at least sober enough to realize how much that would, it wouldn't be fair to him. I actually passed out thinking about how it wasn't fair to the person who had to clean me up because it was going to be nasty. It was going to be bad cleanup. But anyways, what I want people to realize is that it's all vibration. Everything is vibration and you could literally change anything. And I've been addicted to the hardest of drugs at the earliest, most developmental age possible. And it wasn't, nice or pleasant to quit, but you're just going to die and you're going to live this miserable, shitty life. And you already feel guilty over the fact that you're doing all these drugs anyways, for those who do do drugs for everybody else. What I've realized is that it's purposelessness. When you have no purpose, you're a ship without a rudder and you're adrift to the conditioning environments that are existing around you. And so what I would love to be able to do, and that's where the Lethality University really developed initially is I wanted to help veterans get their minds, their bodies sharp, their skill sets up, become lethal. And then that just transposed over into the general population. I want to help people get their mindset right, get their emotions right, get their bodies right, and then develop the skill set and the habits to where they can become great people in society capable of preserving peace. Those capable of great lethality, capable of preserving great peace. And the veteran community really hits me the hardest because they're trainable people. They're smart people. They just lost their way because of the washing cycle of the U.S. military. But stop being a victim. Stop thinking you're owed something. You ain't owed anything. Just realize that you could fix it and only you could fix it and start making that change today. You could do it. If you kill yourself, you keep turning this country over to the enemy. You keep giving it away to these people who are negatively destroying our government and our way of life. And so it's up to the veteran to be the one strong enough to actually keep themselves moving forward with purpose of preserving the morals and the values of the United States so that we could still live in this beautiful, most prosperous land, the greatest land ever created in the history of humanity ever before. There's never been more time or opportunity or medical health surplus of infrastructure ever in history. And I don't want to see this place go. And I think it's going to be up to the veteran to be the one who stops it. Veterans and business owners. And it's not too freaking late, man. Like it's just, it's, it's not, 
It's not too late. Yeah. Find some purpose. Stop being a victim. Realize mm. that you're capable of amazing things. Stop drinking, smoking weed and jerking off watching Pornhub and get your ass to work because mm. you can make millions and millions of dollars and you can make mm. charities and create organizations that combat human trafficking, drug addiction, veterans transitioning. You could literally create anything if you make enough freaking money for it, or at least leverage the relationships that you have, mm. but why not make the money yourself? I used to think mm -hmm. money was evil, but that was just a psyop that was ran on me my entire life. Fortunately, I was able to break free of it once I became more mentally and emotionally resilient. So, you know, <laughs> I, I love what you said. People who are capable of great lethality are also capable of great peace. And I do think that's why uh veteran and the veteran community can, um, I mean, there's a lot of veterans and the U S military is, uh, you know, one of the large, largest, you know, highly funded organizations in the world. Yeah. And what if, what if, what if I honestly, this is just maybe people call me naive, but I actually think it could be a tool of great peace. It doesn't yeah. have to be a tool of such destruction and bloodshed in the world. It does not have to be. Um, so I guess the, and I, so I appreciate your perspective here. Um, I guess my last question would be, and we can wrap up with this is how would you define peace? What is peace to you? Hmm. Serenity, calm, the ability to think and live and consciously create without the interference or the worry or the anxiety of some sort of external force coming in and physically damaging you. Mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's physical security. It's security. Peace is security to me, but mm -hmm. not in the sense of, well, we need to implement all these government controls. So we have sure. security. It must be with the individual. If every human being had complete security of themselves and the six feet around them, I think we would see world peace. Hmm. Joe, thank you. I, I could, I could talk to you all day. A lot of great stuff here. And um, thank you for being, being my guest on the podcast here. And where, where can people find more about you or get in touch with you and your work? Joe Malone training.com. Pretty simple website there. And you can go on there and there's, the Lethality University, we got a bunch of free material we put up there. Uh, JM Training is YouTube channel. Joseph Malone Official is the Instagram. And I just try to put out as much helpful information as I possibly can for people every single day. So check it all out. It's all free. Awesome. Thank you so much for being my guest on the show. Thanks for the work that you're doing. Thank you so much for listening all the way through to the end of this podcast episode. When you show up and you receive the gift that was for you in this episode, it not only benefits you, it benefits all those that you love and the wider world around us. This work that you're doing, the hunger that you have, it's so important and I commend you for tuning in and being open. If this podcast has been a blessing to you, then I would ask that you do something to give back to this episode to get back to this podcast. One of the things that you can do, and it's cost free, very easy, and is super helpful is if you'll just go to iTunes and rate and review this podcast on iTunes. Also, if you'll go to Spotify, if you listen on Spotify, go to Spotify and rate and review this podcast on Spotify. And if you're watching this on YouTube, please like the video, please subscribe to the channel. It makes a huge difference in the algorithm and it helps people find our show. Thank you again for being here. And until next time, take care.